Lord, I thank you for this message. I pray it goes to our hearts as it has to mine. I would like to thank Michael Frost for his book, Christianity, Keep Christianity Weird. A very insightful book. You should read it. Russian probes, nuclear summits, refugee crises, Me Too, impeachment, Brexit, so much more going on. Millennials who participated in the World Economic Forum Global Shaper Survey said that climate change is the most serious thing affecting the world today. And because of that, 78% of them were willing to make major changes in their lifestyle because of it. Think of that. A belief that someone was willing to make changes in their lifestyle because of? Hmm. That brings up another interesting thought. How would we, as believers, be willing to change our lifestyle for things we believe in? Hmm. These days it seems like almost everything is in flux. How would Jesus respond to the political and the social upheavals that we are currently experiencing? Well, I think I have an answer for that. The same way he responded to the political and social challenges of his own time. Not with acquiescence and passivity, which means he didn't just let it go and forget about it. Not by giving in to the controlling powers of conformity or privacy. He didn't become like everyone else so he would fit in. And he didn't take himself away and become a monk in a cave so that nobody affected him. No, he built a new world order, what Jesus called the kingdom of God. And, I, and there are five things that I'm pretty sure Jesus would do in today's world. One is politics, an even more decisive issue in America today than races. Whether left or right, Democratic or Republican, each side lives in its own little echo chamber. They have their own little preferred TV news networks, their own talk show hosts, their own newspaper columnists, their own social commentators, their own blog writers. They go to their own conventions, they have their own friends, and they even have their own churches. We seem to exist in a big feedback loop. We squelch dissent, and we're becoming more extreme in our thinkings. We arrogantly ignore evidence that our respective positions could be wrong. In fact, we don't want to have anything to do with the other side at all. In a recent Pew survey, that's P-E-W, it was found that 68% of Republicans and 62% of Democrats identify with their political party primarily because of their opposition to the other party. 45% of Republicans and 41% of Democrats felt that the other party was a threat to the nation. If you have not experienced that position in your own little walk, then you need to expand your walk because you're not walking in the same world that I am. And then there's hate. A YouGov survey found that half of all Republicans and a third of Democrats would be somewhat to very upset if a son or a daughter married someone in the other party. Back in 1960, it was 5% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats that would be unhappy at that prospect. In Romans 13, 1-7, Paul says this, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers do not, are, do not cause a fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God for your good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it, bears not, it does bear the sword for nothing, 
does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjugation, not because of wrath, but for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due. And have we forgot that God is the one who rules ultimately? And that there have been many times when he, in his wisdom, his wisdom, <coughs> excuse me, not him, not ours, has often placed bad rulers over his people. The book of Esther, or in, in the Old Testament, the book of Esther, God used the ungodly Persian king Ahilarius, who was swayed by his Jewish queen, Esther, to save the Jews. Is Donald Trump God's ordained man? Yes. But if you take that point of view, which is a biblical point of view, and so is Barack Obama. The people in authority are in authority because God wants them there. How would Jesus respond to the world? By joining in the dissent, the fractionalism, factionalism, by solving all of our issues on Facebook, by hating people from the other party, you know that's not what he'd do. He stood with the poor in spirit and those who were persecuted for the sake of righteousness. He offered comfort to all those who mourn and mercy to the merciful. Jesus told the pure of heart they would see God and the peacemakers that they would be called children of God. And he told us to do the same. I often think that our political views are nothing more than a big web, a trap, a, a net that Satan has built around us that we continue to step into and fall. We spend too much time and energy discussing politics when the way I read the Bible, we should be on the front lines actually being the hands and feet of Christ. How can we do that? Well, you can help them collect and distribute food to those who are needy. Matter of fact, on Thursday, this week, you can do that. It'd be coming up to uh, the social services up there on Thursday morning. They bring the trucks in and they need to get it back inside. If you haven't been there, it's a good experience. Nice people, you'll fit right in and you'll see some of the people that need to be helped. They'll come right after that. First of all, you unload the trucks and get everything ready, and next time, then you come, and the people who need it come, and you help them put it in their cars. You can volunteer at a hospital, an old folks' home, or children's home. You can even read a book to somebody. Just spend some time with somebody who is lonely. Get involved. And when they ask you why, you can tell them about Jesus. Matthew 28 says this, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The second thing is Jesus would follow God's values, not heroes. It never ceases to amaze me how many people fawn on the thoughts and actions of sports figures, politicians, and even actors. Take a good look at who you are. You can do that by seeing who you listen to, how they shape your attitudes, and why. I never understand why people give so much authority to actors who spend their entire lives acting like someone else. We even have our own heroes in the political arena. And by saying that, I am not proposing a withdrawal from the political process. 
as good citizens of a free democracy, as a republic democracy, democratic republic, we need to exercise our privilege and we need to engage politicians about the issues that mean so much to us. And by the way, you can go do that. All of the politicians, all of them are available. You can walk up on the hill and talk to Aaron Bernstein. You can walk into anyone's office. I don't know if you've ever done that, but uh, if there's an issue coming up, and there's plenty of them, you can go and tell them your views. They actually like to hear that. They'll give you a cup of coffee, sit you down, listen to what you have to say. We should vote responsibly. We can never put our confidence in the political process alone, though, to deliver the liberation that Jesus promised us. We know that the goal of the political process can't just be liberation from something. We must be liberated into something. Otherwise, will we wind up being liberated only to ourselves and self-expression, and that just becomes another form of bondage. The church is called to offer such a space. Our social reality should display the kingdom of God as a foretaste of things to come. There could be no liberation without the people of God, without us. There could be no liberation. Being a community that embodies God's values is more important than looking for the next leader to save us from our troubles. Jesus did not come to be that heroic leader. Matthew shows us that. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I love that. That's like, a, you think? And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you're this Christian person that you say you are, then you should. You need to. You ought to be. Tell these stones to become bread. Tell them to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city, took him way up and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down because it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and then they will lift you up with their hands so that you will not strike even your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put your Lord God at the test. And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor and said, all this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to me, away from me, Satan, for it is written, the Lord, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Jesus could have been that guy. He was enticed by the tempter in the wilderness, and he resisted the urge to become that heroic leader himself. He could have turned the stones into bread. He could have descended from the highest point of the temple carried by angels. He could have rode a goat from there if he wanted to. He could have done anything he wanted to do. He could have commanded all nations to bow before him. And one day they will. But he chose a different way. He chose to instill God's values in the hearts of a handful of fishermen, some tax collectors, former prostitutes, housewives, a bleeding woman, a lame man, a blind man, a demon-possessed man, and you. And then to unleash them on the world. The third thing is Jesus would put flesh on truth. If we ask what Jesus would do today, we can be sure of one thing. He would walk among us. He would put on flesh and walk among us. That's what we need to do. 
We have to embrace the incarnational mission of Jesus. We can't merely preach about truth. We also have to bring healing and justice and kindness and mercy to a broken world. I love the message. And in the message version of John 1.14, it says it like this. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. This involves living a life pattern on the incarnation of Jesus. This is when God came down. He became flesh to show us the way. We need to be enabled by the continuing power of that incarnation of Jesus, God come down, and joining the ongoing mission of God in this world. How do we do that? By the Spirit that He gave us. Do you realize that you have the living Spirit of God indwelling in you? And that means you can do the same things Jesus did? John 16 says it like this, But now I go away to him who sent me. <coughs> Excuse me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has now filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. And if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Before the world gets convicted of sin, and righteousness and judgment. We need to be convicted of sin, of righteousness, and of the coming judgment. Matthew 8 goes on, and this is the one that gets me. It, you know, if you rode with the, our motorcycle club, you would hear this scripture all the time. As you go, preach the message. The kingdom of God is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely you have been given, so freely give. We ask for the kingdom of God to be right here, right now, the same way it is in heaven, right now. How often does that thought cross your mind? How many times a day does the realization that you have the Spirit of God in you click in your head and you realize that you are being changed moment by moment into something that more closely resembles Jesus Christ. Don't worry about God asking you to raise the dead if you never followed him in small ways first. That could look as beautiful in every day as cooking for somebody, making small talk, telling stories, tending animals, community garden watching sports together, playing music, maybe reading books. It can also be as grand as fostering babies, supporting poor and simple mothers, visiting prisons, volunteering our time to help the unemployed, the helpless, the homeless, the disabled, and those that are beaten down by circumstances beyond their control, or even circumstances in their control. It doesn't really matter. These are the places where, as Garrison Keller puts it, the gravy soaks in and the grace shines through. Jesus would model an alternate way. When Jesus called his disciples together, he gave them a new way to live. He taught a complete revolutionary direction for them to follow. He taught them to offer forgiveness to their persecutors. And so I have to ask, have you? Is there anyone that you still hold a grudge against? That you still have ill will towards? You really will not walk fully in the paths of righteousness until you have fixed those things with God. Have you showed humility to others? Or does it always have to be your way or the highway? Do you have you sought to reconcile even when it wasn't your fault? Have you gone to the ones hurting because of their own stupidity and offered the love of God instead of judgment? Have you kept your mouth shut 
and refuse to justify yourself to build a bridge with someone who's hurting? Jesus showed them how to shame their oppressors by offering the other cheek. He embodied the way of humility and suffering. And so I have to ask again, have you? He gave them a new way to deal with money by sharing it. Have you? The question is not about how much you have. It's about how much you are willing to give of the things given to you. I always remember, I, I don't like taking things from people. There have been times in my life where I really needed help. And there have been good friends, thank God, who have always come and said, here. And I remember one guy, it was Reverend Bill Bloom. And he gave me $50. And I said, no, 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 no I don't want that. And he looked at me, he got mad. He said, don't you rain on my, my blessing. He said, somebody bless me with money and I'm blessing you. Don't you dare rain on my blessing. You let me bless you. I was blessed. He nailed me. The Bible calls for 10% and they call it a tithe. Have you ever gotten to the point to trust the Lord in that? And if not, I urge you to give it a shot. Give it a try. God has made a challenge and he will take care of you with abundance if you trust him. Instead of calling on his followers to smash the existing system, which was as corrupt as the existing system is today, Jesus inspired them to build a new order. He did that by giving them a new pattern for relationship between men and women, between parents and children, between slaves and masters. It was a radical new vision of what it really means to be a human being. Rather than either opting into poly politic, party politics or ignoring the system completely, Jesus' people found a third way the way of modeling, modeling an alternate society, an antidote to the sound and fury that characterizes most civil discourse this day. I always see the picture. It was a, at an LGBT convention, and I don't know if you've ever seen any of those, but they're pretty, pretty weird, pretty crazy. People were marching down the street, and there was a guy and a girl. And they had T-shirts that said, free hooks. And people were looking at them and leaving the crowd of angry protesters chanting and going over and getting a hug and breaking down and crying in the stranger's arms who only offered a hug. That's what Jesus calls us to be. That's the kind of people we're supposed to be. Jesus would pray for the kingdom come. If there's anything we can be sure of in the midst of this current turmoil is that Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. That's the Lord's prayer. And it was given to us by Jesus in Matthew 6. So what does it look like when God's will is done on the earth? Well, there's lots of ways to imagine it. But some of the ways I imagine it, I expect it will include art and music and poetry and shared laughters and picnics, picnics ride motorcycles, as well as moral outrage and soup kitchen and special privileges for kids, kids only, and wonder and humor and endless love all to counterbalance that immobilizing realization that there are tyrants in the world, that there are stirring children, there are death camps, and there is plain old everyday greed. Its fullest realization will come only when Christ returns. It isn't something we can create by ourselves, but it is the healing this world needs. And so we pray, and I ask you to join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. And Father, we come to you today admitting that we are flawed, uncouth people attempting to change the world by our own wishes and might. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us that we have left the trail your Son set us upon so long ago. Restore us. Place our feet firmly back upon the way. Give us hope that all your will can be accomplished without our micromanaging. Allow us to see the good and to join where you where you're working to heal the sickness and pain in this fallen world. Let us pause from our toil to hear the birds sing in the morning, to watch the sunrise, to give thanks for your new daily mercies. Keep evil at bay in our lives, we pray. Restore health to our friends and family. Heal the ungodly governments that rule this world as you shine your light upon it. These things we cannot do ourselves. Forgive us to trying to manipulate through our own might. We need you, Lord, and all we do, every day, all day. We love you, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. We await your return. Amen. Go in peace. I love and serve the Lord. <laughs>